Chapter 4 Slavery, Freedom, and the Struggle for Empire 21763. This chapter has an awful lot of information, and as I told you at the end of last chapter, it's 41 pages long. You do need to, if not read it, at least skim the chapter because I'm not going to cover everything that's in it. According to your title, you have three issues we're going to discuss. Actually, there's four, but there are three main ones. And of course, the big ones are slavery, freedom, and the struggle for an empire. But really, we're going to have in there religion, wars, slavery. And I'll try to explain to them as best I can. Uh, sometimes reading a chapter can be a little bit confusing. But I even found a couple of words in there that uh, I didn't know what they were when I looked them up. According to the dictionary, there's no such word, so I, I can only assume that it means that it's typographical error. But I don't think you'll have trouble if you skip over the word and you know the meaning of the sentence. So here we go. Transatlantic trade, as they call it, or slave trade, it, it flourished in the 1700s. And although we're bringing in slaves and, and we're dealing all over the Atlantic area, the Caribbean area continues to be the British Empire's commercial center and their major revenue producer. But we have something called the triangular trade. In other words, uh, we'll start with Africa. In Africa, we pick up slaves and we take them to 99.9% .9 time to the Caribbean islands where they were to be either um, trained, uh, seasoned, uh, broken, have whatever you want to use to make them domicile slaves because when they were first arrived from Africa they're not very happy people. So you used to trade the slaves in in the Caribbean and in return you get molasses and some agricultural goods which you ship to New England. In New England, the rum is turned into molasses and more manufactured goods are picked up and it's gone back to Africa where the rum and manufactured goods are traded for slaves. So you have the triangular trade from the Africa to the Caribbean to the New England area to back to Africa. And during this time, more than three million slaves arrived in the New World between 1492 and 1820. And the slave trade is vital to England's growth. As a matter of fact, the slave trade is going to become so vital that it's going to be a slave wage force, a slave labor force, instead of a what we call wage earner labor force. Now, the first mass produced consumer goods in the colonies produced was sugar, rice, and tobacco. It was produced by the slaves, and of course, by having the slaves grow this, uh, the demand for the sugar, rice, and tobacco increases. It stimulates the growth of slavery. Now, although the Caribbean is very, very important, it's going to be the North American slave trade that's going to produce commercial products that are going to be growing in importance. And you have people, if you scratch some of these New England and Yankee famous rich families, if you scratch them deep enough, you're going to find that back in the 1700s, they were probably involved in the slave trade. Uh, like the text says merchants from New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island participated in and profited from the slave trade. I know they didn't go to the slave markets and buy and sell. They would furnish the money for ships or furnish the uh, insurance for it. Uh, they were the money manipulators. Even They didn't get their hands dirty with the actual trade, but they profited from it. And in Great Britain, the slave trade stimulated the rise of the port cities like Liverpool and Bristol. Because it, you've got to have a place to dock these ships when they come in. And it fosters the growth of the banking industry, uh, shipbuilding, of course. Insurance, as I just mentioned. It kind of helped finance the early industrial revolution. And it's just a map to show you that, um, yes, an awful lot of the trade went to South America, but Britain wasn't participating in that particular trade. She was participating in, as you can see, from the uh, east coast of Africa. You've got the Ivory Coast, the Gold Coast, and the Slave Coast. This is where most of the slaves were picked up. And these areas were given the name by Europeans because that's where these items were. And in this area is where they got the ivory, in this area was the gold, and this is where they bought the slaves. And they would come to the Caribbean islands. And for the most part, they would go directly to New England. And as you can see, all the different things that were 
traded around. It was quite a profitable business. Africa in the beginning had had slaves. I don't know if we mentioned this too much or not, but slavery, of course, has been around for almost well, since the beginning of time. But originally, slavery, well, you became a slave because you couldn't pay your debts, uh, because you were captured in a war, uh, you were had done something wrong or were a convict. You were never gone out and captured and to be sold as a slave. And in the beginning, Africa was selling slaves to the Portuguese that were people that were prisoners of war that captured. And they're starting to buy with the proceeds of selling the slaves, they're starting to buy European goods. So like I said, at first they were really prisoners of war that were being selling. But as the demand increases, they don't longer have the wars or the, you know, don't have the prisoners, so they have to go out and capture. And capture they did, and it caused a lot of problems between the inner tribes, each one wanting to have the most slaves and the best slaves to sell to the Europeans. The problem being, in the very beginning, it's going to devastate because they're going after good, healthy, strong male slaves. And once you take the strongest and the best out of any population, your demographics are going to change. It devastated the population in Western Africa. And then once you captured them, you marched them to the coast. And it was not the Europeans who were going in and doing this. It was the Africans themselves who were going in and capturing and bringing the prisoners back and keeping them in large slave pens, if you would, along the slave coast to sell to English captains. And once they were sold to the English captains, they'd be put on a boat and they would go into this infamous middle passage. The first part of the passage, of course, would be coming from their home where they'd been captured to the Atlantic shore. They'd be packed like sardines, shackled together. They didn't have any room to move around. They, they had to lay in their own human waste. It was hot and no air moving. You couldn't move. It was a bad scene no matter how you looked at it. And of course, these are not actual photographs. They're drawing. The one on the left is showing you how below deck they would be packed like sardines. And sometimes they would be allowed to sit up. At, the one on the right is where they're sitting up on the deck. But they still don't have any room. But the ship captains and their crew were supposed to know they had to have some air every now and then. They had to bring them up on deck. And sometimes they bring them up on deck and force them to dance. Uh, their theory being, you know, a little exercise. Well, unfortunately, if you were a young female and forced to dance naked, uh, sometimes it was not for your own exercise. It was for the entertainment of the crew. And if you objected, of course, <laughs> they just throw you overboard. Again, the one on the left shows you packed like sardines, and they didn't want to waste any space whatsoever because to them, the captured slaves were, well, it was their, how they're going to make their money. It was their product to sell. On the right is this offensive drawing of a white man standing on a, looks like a stump of a tree. He's the overseer watching the slaves do the planting, and he's up higher than they are so you can see what's going on. And by the 18th century, the mid-18th century, the middle 1700s, there was three distinct slave systems in British North America. And we've got to distinguish between the Caribbean slaves, the Central America slaves, and the South American slaves. We're talking about British North America. In the Chesapeake Bay region, you had the tobacco-based slavery. Further south in South Carolina and Georgia, you had rice-based plantation slavery. And then, of course, in the north, the New England and the middle colonies, you had the non-plantation slavery. So you have three distinct types of slavery. And slavery itself is going to transport the Chesapeake Bay area and society into a very elaborate hierarchy of degrees of freedom. And I've got a list of the way it goes. You've got the large landed people who dominated society and government. And later on, it wasn't just the landowner. It came to include merchants who did business with the landowners and the lawyers who would defend the slave owners' rights in courts. Below them, uh, you have the lesser planters and the yeomen, uh, small plantation owners with one or two slaves, or the yeoman with no slave. Then you had the indentured servant, and believe it or not, a few free blacks. You had the tenant farmers, and then the convicts and the slaves. So, of course, the convicts and slaves are on the very bottom end of the society ladder. And, of course, as the more slaves' population increase, uh, well, the white man becomes a little bit, shall we say, um, a little bit alarmed, and so they start passing laws to not only enhance their power over them, but to get control. Because the slave is seen as property, it was a, something you had purchased. And you, of course, could punish them, and the main punishment was, of course, whipping. And I know this is a bad analogy, but it's like 
uh, you're not going to pay hundreds or a thousand dollars for a slave and then go out there and, and punish him so severely that he can't work. The whole idea of the punishment from the planter's point of view was to instill fear and obedience into the slave. So you might want to hurt him, but you don't want to disable him. It'd be like buying a John Deere tractor and when it wouldn't start, you go out there and you cut the tires and take the battery out. Uh, no, that, uh, you're, not going to, you're not going to completely destroy your worker. But the whites began to see the free blacks that were around as dangerous and unwanted because if I'm a plantation owner and I've got 50 slaves out here, I don't want a couple of free blacks roaming around because it might give my slaves the idea they can be free too. So we do more and more to restrict their rights and in Virginia a law was even passed to require the free blacks to leave the colony. Now your text states that Indian slavery was a, it begun in uh, early Carolina, but we know from studying that Carolina was the only colony that was begun with slavery. The other 12 colonies were begun, but in the beginning it was just white settlers and indentured before they came to slavery. But in Carolina, this, the colony was begun with slavery, but they tried to turn to Indian slavery because the Indians were available. But the Indians knew the area and they didn't want to be slaves, so they kind of, you know, drifted off into the forest. And as we're turning more and more to slavery, some of the Indian tribes, like the Creeks and some of the other tribes, uh, at first they would sell their captured Indians, prisoners of war, or just go out and capture other Indians and sell to the white man as slaves. And finally it dawned on, you know, hey, uh, <laughs> we don't like what the English are doing, number one, and us doing this, what's to keep another tribe from enslaving us? So they kind of faded out into the forest and the English had no choice but to turn and look somewhere else for labor force. Because, they, like I said, they were selling the Indians too, along with deer skins and furs. And because of the rice cultivation in the low country of Carolina, uh, you're going to have more and more slaves come in. And the more slaves you have coming in that are black and slaves with no rights, you're going to see a growing racial divide between the whites and the blacks. Now, South Carolina has a lot of distinctions. Uh, one of them being the only colony that ever started with slaves, and two, she was the first colony to have a major population of blacks. Just 10 years later, North Carolina had two thirds of her population was black. But along with rice, indigo was introduced in the 1740s as a very profitable crop in the Carolinas. And they used gang labor to farm the, the indigo, they used task labor in the rice fields. Now, I think we went through the definitions of gang labor and task labor last time. But just to remind you, gang labor is when you have a group working under an overseer uh, and you work from sunup to sundown. Task labor is when a group of uh, slaves are given a job or a task to do, and once that task is performed, they can go on their merry way. And the white man was smart enough. He didn't want to go out in those rice fields. I mean, they had snakes out there. They had malaria out there. I mean, now, we'll just set this area aside. We want rice. We'll tell these slaves, we well, X done. And when X is done, then you can go to your home and do whatever you want to. And it's going to be the group that is working in task labor, such as the rice fields. Uh, we were going to see a decidedly African-American culture developing because they have more time and they're not around the white folks. Now, Georgia, of course, was the last colony to be established in 1733. And originally it was a refuge for debtors. Uh, it was also sold to the king as an idea to be a buffer between the Spanish and Florida in that profitable colony of Carolina. They tried growing grapes, they tried growing rice, they even tried bringing in silkworms to, to grow, make silk. It, nothing worked. Uh, they couldn't have slaves, they couldn't have alcohol, they couldn't have more than 50 acres of land, and they couldn't sell it. And it was not profitable. The, the people there were just not happy at all. They kept looking up toward the north at the Carolinas and Maryland and seeing how profitable they were. And less than 20 years, the king pulls a charter and it becomes a royal colony, and all the Restrictions against slaves and alcohol and selling land were restricted, and it didn't take very long. The Georgia is going to be an awful lot like the colony of Carolina, where the large, wealthy white planter class is going to dominate. <coughs> Excuse me. To remind you again, we had uh, 13 colonies. <coughs> mm, excuse me. Need another cup of coffee, I think. The New England colonies, you've got the middle colonies, which are called the garden colonies, and they're just that. They're the middle between New England colonies and southern colonies. You've got New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. 
uh, in New England and the middle counties, uh, small farms. And slavery was not critical because, I mean, you got a big family and you got a couple of strong sons and you just don't need slaves to farm 10 or 15 acres. Very small percentage of the population. And in the urban areas, even the wealthy families rarely owned more than one slave and it was usually a personal slave. And in some of them worked as farm labor, but very few in, in the middle colonies. They worked in the artisan shops as helpers. They worked on the docks as stevedores, or as I said, as personal servants. And sometimes slaves in the North even had a few legal rights. For instance, in New England, slaves could not be severely physically punished. They could bring lawsuits in courts against their master if he did something wrong, or someone, a shop owner cheated them or something. And slave marriages were actually recognized. And although there was a large number of slaves present in New York and Philadelphia, uh, it was usually around the docks. And although many employers of slave labor turned to wage labor just shortly before the American Revolution. And this is just a, a graph showing you what the percentage of slaves were to the overall population in 1770, right before the Revolution. And as you can see, Massachusetts had less than 1%, and by the time the Revolution comes around, she's not going to have any. And I'm not proud to say that it's South Carolina that has the largest percentage, 61 percent of the population in South Carolina in 1770 was black slaves. North Carolina and Virginia is right behind her. Georgia, as you know, is what we call the hard south. But the Africans are a very diverse population because whereas most of the Africans in the early 1700s and 1600s were born in Africa, once we get into the late 1700s and early 1800s, the slaves we have are native born. And they had begun to form their own culture. And as I said, there's three distinct slave systems, like the Chesapeake Bay area. It's a rather healthy climate once we got over the killing time. They have a balanced sexual ratio, and they're continually exposed to the white culture. So they're not going to develop their own culture as much as try to incorporate themselves into the white culture. In South Carolina and Georgia, you've got very harsh working conditions it's a different culture altogether because you're using more of the task system you've got the blacks to a separate area to themselves and they unfortunately do have a low birth rate because of the malaria and the snakes etc but they are developing their own African culture they're incorporating what little they know of the white culture with what they brought what they heard from their parents about the African culture but in the northern area the slavery a uh, small amount small groups and you're living totally immersed in a white population. So there again when you've got one slave to household for instance, uh, he's going to emulate the white master in his dress and his speech and his activities so the Af African American culture is going to develop very very slowly in that area. It didn't matter whether you were in the South, Middle or New England uh, you all had something in common. You were a slave and one thing you wanted was freedom. And resistance? Well, it was common common was running away, which we talked about. And I found it quite interesting. I'd never really thought about it before, but it makes sense that if you ran away and could get into a large area, a large city like Philadelphia or New York or Boston, you could maybe assume a free blacks identity. I thought that was pretty cool. The most uncommon was of course the slave uprising. And your text mentions a couple of them. And the first one occurred in New York in 1712, and where there was a group of slaves decided to burn buildings and they killed whites who came to try to put out the fires. Of course, you know, it's, it, they're outnumbered totally by the whites, and the whites had weapons and the blacks didn't. The resurrection, not resurrection, but the revolution or the revolt or whatever you want to call it, it was quickly put down and they were arrested, and their punishment at that time was to be punished according to your crime. So you burn a building down, you're going to get burned. A lot of them were burned alive. And it was to punish as well as to give a warning to the city slave population. So between 1730 and 1740, we're going to see uh, the doors open to slave resistance in Louisiana and the West Indies. Well, we're going to have a revolution in the West Indies, number one. And uh, Louisiana it's very, very heavily populated with runaway slaves, and we're going to have problems there. You're also going to get involved in imperial wars, and I have a list here. Begin's Rebellion we talked about last time. Jacob's Lesser we talked about last time. I'm going to disagree with the War of Jacob's here with what they tell you and what I tell you, but you've got King George's War, the Seven Years' War, which we're going to cover at the end of the chapter. You've got Queen Anne's War, the Peacock War, King Philip's War. Uh, these are wars that the Indians are going to be brought in 
to side with the English. In the War of Jenkins here, the, your text tells you it's between England and Spain, and it prompted some South Carolina slaves to attempt to go to Spanish Florida. It took place, of course, at Stono and was crushed, which led to harsh tightening of South Carolina slave laws. That Stono Rebellion, of course, is pretty big in South Carolina history, and it's been well, the slaves didn't write down what they were doing when they were doing it. Most of the information we have about the rebellion is written from the white plantation owner's perspective. And of course it's going to be a little bit skewed in their favor. Uh, between Spain and England, so why were we having something going on here? Well, it started a long time ago uh, when there was a rule in the Spanish Empire that the Spanish colonies in Central America could not trade with anyone but the uh, Spanish. And there were many, many occasions where it happened because the Spanish would be out there alone and they'd see an English ship and they'd want to trade. Well, Captain Jenkins was an English sea captain who got caught by the Spanish trading with the Spanish in the Caribbean. And to show an unusual sensitivity, they did not execute him, but they did cut off his ear. Well, several years later, he is in England and he shows up in Parliament waving this blackened piece of flesh saying it's his ear that the Spanish had cut off and it was going to prompt a war between England and Spain. And of course the Spanish were controlling Florida and Florida had this rule that if you were an escaped slave and you made it to Florida you would be treated as a free Spanish citizen. So the story goes that there was some slaves at Stono who decided to rebel and uh, they broke into a warehouse thinking it was empty. Only it wasn't empty. The owner was there along with someone else so they killed him. And it spiraled out of control downhill from there. The debate being, did these slaves know about the uh, war between France and Spain? Were they aware that the, if you admitted to Spanish Florida, you would be free? Uh, were these men seasoned slaves? Were they rebellious slaves that had just been brought in? There's so much that we don't know. And like I say, if you go to the library and get books on the Stono Rebellion, you'll find 14 different viewpoints. We do know that there were some slaves that killed whites. There was an uprising that was overturned and of course the reaction to the white plantation owners anytime there's problems with the slaves is make more rules and tighten restrictions, which is what happened. In 1741 in New York City there was a series of fires and of course rumors got started. And we don't know for sure here again, uh, did the slaves actually start the fires or did they take advantage of some fires that were accidentally started? We do not know. But there was a series of fires. The rumor started and the rumor stated that the slaves were planning a rebellion to take over New York City and the colony of New York and then turn it over to the Spanish. Well, of course, that didn't happen. This, the rebellion was quickly put down and 150 people were arrested. Uh, 34 were executed of the four whites who had supposedly helped them. And when you look at the records of the trial transcript and like I say, it's all written from the point of view of the officials of New York. Um, we don't know for sure. Uh, my personal opinion is that a fire accidentally started and the slave decided to take advantage of it and it just grew. Because like I said, they all wanted to be free. They didn't like being slaves. So anything they could do to get free. And here again, I don't think they thought it through because when you're when you're such a small percentage of the population and you have no weapons. Uh, you're committing suicide. So let's switch from slavery to the opposite end of the scale and talk about liberty for a few minutes. To the British citizen, liberty meant more than just the privileges you gained from the social class. Liberty to them meant the right to resist an arbitrary government. And at this time in England, and I'm stressing in England or Great Britain, Liberty contained two sets of ideas, which we call republicanism and liberalism. Now, this is not the republicanism and liberalism of today. This is the 1700s. Republicanism was the belief that only citizens who owned property and were willing to subordinate themselves and their self-interest to the common good were free. Of course, these ideas resounded in the colonies. They resounded in the colonies more than they did in England. So republicanism is the belief in subordinating yourself and self-interest to the common good or what we call public virtue. And liberalism, like I say, means different today. 
Back in the day, the leading English philosopher John Locke argued that governments were made through social contracts in which part of the rights of the person, of the individual, to govern themselves is turned over to a government as long as that government didn't interfere in their religion, family, or economic life. Well, that makes sense. You're busy out here, you know, killing Indians and felling trees. You haven't got time to go to town and vote. But he also went so far to say that the government, the governed, had the right to rebel if the government was unjust. Well, I don't think he used the word rebel. I think he used it in his treaty saying he had the, they had the right to replace or overturn. But that's treason. That's treason. And, of course, we in the colonies loved it. Now, this picture of John Locke, or this painting of John Locke, he doesn't look like the type of man who cared two hoops in hell about the common man, does he? He looks like a very aristocratic snob. My goodness, that wig. I wish I had hair that long. Anyway, a bit of background. Like I said, these ideas are resounding in the colonies much more so than they are in England. And in a lot of ways, the colonies were more democratic than Great Britain was. Where the qualifications for voting were pretty much the same. Male, property. You, women, children, and slaves, and Indians could not vote. But even though the property qualifications were, were were in place in England, in England very few people owned land. But here, with the wide ownership of land, we had a greater white population that could vote. And in some of the colonies, and not the South, but in some of the colonies, free blacks could even vote. And in some colonies, they demanded religious membership. But, you know, I could, we could change your membership today and run tomorrow. But there, there, we didn't have competitive elections. Uh, the common man, you and I, would just, well, we would ascend to the better-offs. The man who had property, who had time to go to town and talk about politics instead of standing out here felling trees and killing Indians. So competitive elections were rare. You, you, you just didn't have two aristocrats up there fighting it out. But because of things that are going on back home, problems with, you know, who's going to be the king, queen of England, and problems with Spain and France and all around. Uh, I think it's called imperial rivalries. Britain ignored us. Let's run ourselves. Not because they were having profitable trade. Why would they want to bother? You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But this caused our local assemblies to get more and more under control, and especially by the large landowners, and they became more powerful and as they're the only ones running for election, they wind up being in the government and they wind up governing. Well, England passed a series of laws called the Trade and Navigation Laws or Acts. And this was supposed to eliminate pirating, it was supposed to eliminate black marketing, uh, and help gain taxes for the home country. Like we discussed last chapter, mercantilism, you know, keep all the money in England. Well, the colonies didn't like it. As I pointed out, the coast along the east coast of our country has just got hundreds and thousands of little coves where you can dock a ship and unload it. So if we didn't like the laws, we just avoided them. After all, the colonies are prosperous. We're on good relations with our mother country. England's making money from us. We're making money from them. I mean, everything's fine. Why make waves? And while this is going on, what we call the public sphere of politics are just growing. The gentry, or the upper class, the landed people, were writing letters and making speeches and writing newspaper articles and pamphlets, all about politics and discussing them. And this world of political debates growing, and even political clubs are forming, and the one that's mentioned in your text is Benjamin Franklin's Hunter, which is one of the most widely known and respected because of Ben Franklin, not because of the influence of the Hunter. So most men of influence were writing and reading, and but it's the common man's beginning to discuss and debate this thing called liberty. They're talking about it in the pubs, you know, I mean, gee whiz. What we call traveling liberties. Uh, this is a fancy way of saying the word spreading around. More and more common people are learning and discussing politics. I mean, people who, well, you know, they didn't have the education. I mean, who were these common folks thinking that they were qualified to run a government? The upper class was very coity-toity, if you would, about uh, the lower class not having the ability. It's the upper class's duty to run the government and run the country. It's your business as a lower class man to farm and to hunt and to manufacture goods. You don't have the time or the intelligence. And anyone on a newspaper who wrote an article about 
liberties are going too far, uh, the authorities, and they were local authorities, these were not British authorities. They tried to suppress the newspapers, especially they didn't support them. And by 1740, of course, every colony had newspapers, and they were weekly or monthly. But back in 1729, Benjamin Franklin bought and started publishing something called the New England Journal. And now it's no longer just religious news printed in the paper. It's not just news of what's going on in London, if you would. And it's not just news about the government of London, but we're having political commentary. Hmm. And the words freedom of speech is heard over and over again. Well, freedom of speech was an expression everybody was familiar with, but it did not apply to you or me, the common man. It was a rule that was passed because Parliament was having a hard time functioning, because anything they said that was contrary to the king's wishes or against the king, they could be arrested and executed for treason. So they passed the law that when you were in the Parliament building and you were doing parliamentary business, that you could say nasty things if you would about the king, and you would not be arrested. But the minute you went out the door and stepped down the steps, you better watch your tongue. So the freedom of speech was not for you and me or the common man. It was strictly for the parliamentarians. And a man called John Peter Zinger, uh, his name does need to be rumored. I think I asked you a question about him. He was a German-born printer, and he published something called the Weekly Journal in New York. And one night, he published a scathing article accusing the governor of corruption and influence peddling. Not the local assembly, the governor. Well, the New York's council had uh, horses burned totally, and then they arrested Zinger for seditious libel. Well, Zinger had a smart attorney. I keep thinking about Perry Mason <laughs> or Johnny Cochran. Uh, after all the, the um, evidence had been heard, and he was guilty according to the law, the way it was written. So Zinger's attorney urged the jury to consider judging the government not Zinger, especially if what Zinger said was true. And the jury acquitted him. And the libel law stated that libel was offending words. It didn't say they had to be harmful or true or untrue. It was offending words. And it remained on the books. But the idea that truth cannot be libel. Wow. This is a good idea. It's becoming, shall we say, ingrained in the common man's mind, the public's mind. If I tell the truth, I can't be arrested. Cool. And something called the Great Awakening comes along. And now we're getting into the religious area. In the early 1700s, things have kind of settled down. So many wars are, the Indian Wars are taken care of, and people are prospering, businesses are growing, we're spreading like yeast, going westward. And we're so busy taking care of our own interests that a lot of the ministers are fearing that because of this westward expansion, expansion and growth of com commerce, Fewer and fewer people are coming to church. So we begin this revival. And it really wasn't a coordinated move. It started in New England, yes. And it started with fiery preaching like hellfire and damn damnation. It was kind of a grassroots growth. And it just kind of grew. And finally, a Methodist minister from England called George Whitfield came and did a two-year tour of America. Now, he didn't do the hellfire and damnation and pound on the pulpit. He told you that, and this is a picture of him, very mild looking man. Uh, he said, God is merciful. And people are not predestined for heaven or hell. That you could even save yourselves from hell if you repented of the bad life you're leaving, living and live a good life afterwards. Whoa! This sounds good. That means that even if I did something bad yesterday, I could repent and say I'm sorry. And a little bit of Catholicism in there, kind of like, not really like a confession, but repent to God, not to people. And if you live, continue living a good life, you can save your soul. Well, traveling ministers begin to hold meetings and follow in Whitfield's footsteps and preach the same thing. Of course, we had a few fiery hellfire and brimstone, but for the most part, they were telling about a loving, forgiving God. And these were new concepts, and the people loved it. And these meetings were called revivals, and these traveling ministers began to be called evangelicals. But the established church didn't like them. And, you know, what are you talking about? You, you know, th this isn't right. And the congregations of the church is split into what we call the new light and the old light. And the new light is accepting these theories that God is merciful and will forgive you and you can save your own soul. Whereas the old light says, no, uh, a lot of you are predestined. Uh, you can't do it. you got to do it through the church. Stick to the church's old dogma or their old traditions. 
and there was a lot of new churches formed. The Baptists and the Methodists were something new, and Presbyterians were established, but and they were kind of the holy toity, but they were even starting to send ministers into the frontier lands of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Ohio. Uh, but these new lights, they're criticizing having to pay tax to support a state church. And it's being to lead to a cry that religious freedom is a natural right. What, what, what's this natural right business? This is something new. That every person is born with certain unalienable rights? This is from the uh, philosophers in Europe and France and England particularly. An individual should be able to choose their own religion. The state shouldn't tell me who I sh how I should worship. I do not accept the dogma. These were some main things that came out of this particular movement. Uh, the questioning. Kind of came out of the enlightenment mood in, in Europe where you're going to question and to experiment. Don't just accept someone's word on something, try to find out why. But there were those who didn't fit into the mold, either the new light or the old light. They were called deists. And the first time I told someone when they asked me what my religion was, I said, I'm a deist. I said, oh, do you? You're a witch. No, deists and witches are not the same. Um, a deist believes in God, but he believes in a non-interfering God. God set the world in motion and he kind of sat back and he kind of looked at us and go, hmm, shaking his head or scratching his head or whatever you want to do, but he's not interfering in our everyday life, which is contrary to what the original feeling was, that God was with you at all times, he was in your life at all times. Uh, they're not saying that God won't answer a prayer, they're just saying that he's not going to arbitrarily interfere in your life. And of course the most famous deist was Ben Franklin. I love that picture, Frank. And if I could meet any man in history, he is the man I would want to go back and meet. Uh, and then be a fly on the wall. I, I, there was no way I could debate this man. But some of these new churches that were from they condemned slavery. When they would hold a revival meetings, they would have blacks and whites sitting together in church. And a few slave owners, not many, but a few, after repenting, actually freed their slaves. And the messages that are coming from the pulpit of equality, the black, free, and slave, they liked what they heard. And many of them began preaching themselves, uh, even though they couldn't read or write, they had good memories. But the revivalist goal was a spiritual salvation. It had nothing to do with revolving, uh, revolting against the government or changing laws. It was just save your soul. But it's going to help spark social, political, and a lot of revolutionary thought. Okay, now we're going to go from revision to imperial wars. France and Spain are territorial, very large in the New World, but they had a lot smaller population and they were not as economically developed as the English colonies. And while the Spanish Empire stretched from the Pacific Coast to New Mexico and the Great Plains of Texas and then back to Florida, they, after 1763, they had a very few small outposts, and although they tried to revigorate its older colonies in the early 1700s, they failed. But in California, fearing Russian settlement because the Russians were coming down that Pacific coast, Spain successfully colonized with missions and presidios much of the coast of California. But like the English, they brought diseases, and they introduced the resettlement of the Indians, and well, they devastated California's native population. And meanwhile, more and more white people are going out there, and it's causing problems. Seven Years' War is what it's called in England. Uh, we call it the French and Indian War here. The French are claiming all of known Canada, the Ohio and the Mississippi River Valleys, while the England are claiming from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from sea to sea. Hmm. The French are even placing iron plates up and down the Ohio River all the way to western Kentucky. Now this is a map. Now look at this map. Uh, I mean, the green right here is English, and this is the Appalachian Mountains right here. That's all we've got. Just a little bit of land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, Florida is controlled by Spain. All this area is Spanish. But look at what France is claiming. Holy jumping Jehoshaphat. All the way to the Appalachian Mountains and what we know as Quebec and Montreal. Now here's a little colony called New Orleans. This is the Mississippi River. Going up, 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 up. But back here, 
you have a branch off of the Mississippi is something called the Ohio River. It goes all the way up. And you come up here a little bit further and you've got, oh my gosh, you've got the Missouri River. Now these areas of Fort Vincennes, which is in what is now Indiana, Fort Miami is what is now Ohio, because Catchet was is right there on the edge of Kentucky and Indiana and Illinois. Not Indiana, Illinois, but Indiana and Illinois. Um, she's claiming it all. This is called the Ohio anything north of the Ohio River and the Mississippi River East is called the Ohio Valley area. Anything around the Mississippi River is called the Mississippi Valley area. So you've got England, Spain, France, and of course, if you watch real close, you got coming down the coast, you got the Russians. Now we have a governor in the colony of England, a colony of, I'm sorry, of Virginia. It's called Governor Dimwiddle. Now you don't have to remember his name. I just happen to like to say Dimwiddle. He was Scottish. It's even worse. He didn't like the idea that this in France were claiming some of the same area that the English were. We're covering, we're claiming from sea to sea. And the Ohio River Valley area is just full of furs. So he sends an envoy to France, and although the French had no respect for the British or the English, excuse me, I'll get this right in a minute, the colonial militia. Uh, the colonial militia had a habit of and a reputation of firing a shot and running like hell. They were not fighters. They were the early beginnings of our National Guard. They were shopkeepers. They were farmers who would show up for practice once a month or something at the local pubs and sit around and drink and have a few target practices. They were not trained soldiers. So the French who trained their militia in a military fashion had no respect for them, but they did have good looking uniforms. And the end way they sent was a tall, good looking man with looked good and blue, had blue eyes. His name was George Washington. Very well educated and that's the only reason he was received by the French is not because he was a colonial militia officer, but because he was a rich planter. Well, the envoy was received, but the prospect or proposal that Governor Dimwiddle had sent for the French to get the heck out was rejected. Now, unknown to us at the time, the French were building a fort at the present day area of Pittsburgh called Fort de Pecane. And there's going to be a lot of controversy over that because it's at the mouth of the Ohio River. Well, the envoy returns and the governor, and, and this is where your text skips around a bit, the governor sends uh, Washington and a group again to take the area of Fort Duquesne without realizing the French are building a fort there. And it was a disaster. Uh, we don't go into all the details. And that's Washington, who had no military training or experience, he was given the commission strictly because of his position as a rich Virginia planter. Uh, he builds a fort in a valley. Now, I'm not a military person, but even I know that you don't build a fort in a valley because the Indians or the French can get up on the top of the hills and shoot you. And that's exactly what happened. He built this fort called Fort Necessity because it was necessary for him to build it. And he wound up because of a rainstorm and the French overpowering him having to surrender. So you can see that basically the first battle of the French and Indian War, Washington lost. He returns back to Virginia and the governor sends to Britain for uh, some experienced military. And General Braddock, a tough, hard-headed, experienced general arrived with seasoned British troops. Now the French had forts all up and down the Mississippi River and they did it for trade, they did it for transportation to their little colony in New Orleans. Um, she needed transportation for trade and for news. And she's came in the entire Ohio River Valley and Ohio River Valley. She'd also made friends with the local Indians by treating them nicely and as I mentioned in previous chapters the French traded with the Indians, they lived with the Indians, they married with the Indians uh, they just treated them nice. And so if the Indian was given a choice between the British and the French, they would choose the French. But the English had no use for the Indian. They thought they should be exterminated. The only reason they treated them with any modicum of decency was to keep them from all going to the French. Now there's really very few settlers. You could count them in the hundreds south of Canada and west of the Appalachian Mountains. But that doesn't matter because both the countries of France and England who have been at war many, many, many times over the last hundred years, they're both claiming the same land mass. 
Okay, General Braddock shows up with forces of thousands. They're gonna kick Francis' butt. He's pompous, he's proud. He's an experienced military man who's been through many campaigns. He has no respect for the colonial militia or their leaders. And he refused to listen to when George Washington actually told him that the French would fight Indian style and should let us fight Indian style. Braddock said no. The French, even though I don't like them, they're going to fight European style. Where you stand up in the line and you fire, then you kneel down and reload your gun. The people behind you fire, then they kneel down and reload their guns. And whoever has the most men standing at the end of the battle wins it. Well, the Indian style is, I think your little YouTube thing calls it guerrilla warfare. You hide behind a tree and you shoot, then you run like hell to another tree and you shoot behind that tree. And you're running behind a bush and shoot from over here so that your opponent he doesn't really know where you are. He can't see you. And of course, the British love to wear bright red coats. Oh, I think that's why their nickname was the Red Coats. Hmm. But anyway, uh, in the YouTube, it talks about him losing so many men. Uh, he wouldn't listen to Washington, and he refused to believe that the French are going to do anything other than honorable European-style fighting. Well, he had more troops than the French had at Fort Duquesne. So when the French heard he was coming, and they heard he was coming because he's got bagpipes singing, he, they've got these long lines of supplies, they've got people cutting roads through the wilderness. I mean, you could hear them coming for five miles. They were not going to surprise the French. The French realized they couldn't hold up against them. They didn't have the big cannons they needed for a fight, so they sent out scouting parties, if you would, and as the head coats would go through single file through these Indian paths, they would get killed. As a matter of fact, General Braddock was even killed. So the second battle of the French and Indian War, they call it Braddock's Defeat, did not turn out so well. Bad defeat was caused by bad, deci bad decisions, and for several years, uh, the English kept losing. The Indians were more on the French's side, and it, it, they just refused to admit you couldn't do the European style of fighting in the wilderness. But then I put, uh, they saw the white writing on the wall after a couple of years of fighting and began using other local Indian tribes being nice to them, you know, giving them gifts and promising them all this and that, and some Indian style fighting. And they finally, uh, when William Pitt became prime minister in England, this was a money drain. So he decided he made a few changes in leadership and style. And before you know it, by sending, I think it was 20,000 experienced troops he sent over here. They started capturing the major French outposts. They captured the Caribbean possessions, and they got control of the French possessions in India. They also gave aid to other countries who were fighting the Spanish and the French in Europe. This is a truly world war. It's not just here in the colonies over the uh, landmass. It's between France and England, two mighty powers. And it's going to be the first really war, world war that lasts eight years, and it's back and forth. Finally, in 1870, old King George II dies. And the new king, George III, which I told you lived in England and wanted to be truly an English king, he said, this is enough. This war is lasting too long. It's too, it's too costly. End this war. So the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763 after we captured Montreal and Quebec. And that's one of the few dates I want you to remember. The Treaty of Paris in 1763. This is going to be the beginning of the end for the cordial relationships between our two countries. And part of the terms of the treaty was that England was forced France to leave North America totally. So we got all of known Canada. We got the Spanish to give us Florida. And everything from the Mississippi River East, including Florida, Canada. I mean, it's a terrific landmass. And the French are finally out of North America. Now, if I remember right, this is a YouTube on the French and Indian War. Hopefully... Yeah, it is. <laughs>
British and French settlers had reached the strategic Ohio River Valley, controlled by the Iroquois natives and Chief Kanakarasu. The French claim all the land on one side of the river. The English claim everything on the other. If that be the case, I ask, where does the Indian land lie? Tanakaris, 1752. The Iroquois allow the British to build a trading post on their land, thinking it will allow them to live in peace, but it only brings war to the valley. In April 1754, the French arrive and force the British out, tearing down the trade post and building Fort Duquesne. Humiliated and afraid of what the French will do to him, Tanner Harrison encourages the British to take back the fort. That May, without the approval of Parliament, a group of American militia under George Washington attacked the French. In the following battle of Fort Necessity, the British would again be defeated. Impressed, many native tribes, such as the Hurons, signed agreements with France. The lines had been drawn, and war was coming. In 1755, Major General Edward Braddock arrives from Britain with two full regiments, prepared to take Fort Duquesne. For months, his men trained. Braddock believes that the secret to their success was discipline. Savages may indeed be a formidable enemy to your raw American militia, but upon the king's regular and disciplined troops, it is impossible they should make an impression. However, European tactics are not suited for the North American wilderness. Natives and French militia, using guerrilla warfare, are able to rout the British, killing over 500 soldiers, including Braddock himself. In England, the government realizes the war will not be over quickly. Tensions rise, and in 1756, the war that began in North America spreads to the Caribbean, Asia, Africa, and Europe. The winner will decide the fate of the world. That year, General Montcalm becomes commander of the French army. He thinks that with a new strategy, they could quickly defeat the British. It is no longer the time when a few scalps or the burning of a few poems is of any advantage, or even an object. In 1757, he takes nearly 8,000 soldiers into America to attack the British at Fort William Henry. As the French set up positions around the fort, British Colonel Monroe writes to his commander, General Webb. I have no doubt that you'll send reinforcements as soon as possible. Without additional men, we can only hold out for a few days. On August 5th, the French begin the siege of the fort. Meanwhile, Monroe waits desperately for a reply. Three days later, the courier is on his way back to the fort, but is intercepted by a native warrior. The French call a truce and deliver General Webb's shocking reply. I am unable to provide reinforcements to your position at this time. I advise you to negotiate the best terms of surrender possible. Brokenhearted, Monroe agrees to surrender the fort if his men are allowed to leave unharmed. On August 9th, the French take control of Fort William Henry and the British begin their march toward New York. However, the French native allies are upset that they are being denied the spoils of war. They attack the defenseless British column and kill as many as 200 men, women, and children. Fear spreads across British North America and another defeat at Fort Carillion brings morale to an all-time low. The British need a change, soon. Change for the British finally comes from William Pitt, Secretary of State. His devotion to the war effort convinces Parliament to commit all the resources to the fight, and 20,000 men are sent to take New France. With victories at Fort Duquesne and Louisbourg, the British finally have the French on the run. French Captain Bougainville asks for reinforcements from home, but with France suffering defeats around the world, the reply is anything but encouraging. I apologize, sir, but one does not simply save the stables when the house is on fire. By the summer of 1759, the British have arrived at Quebec and have set up camp across from the city. As they prepare to lay siege, all Montcalm can do is wait. I trust in God, come with me as with God. Wait for news from France with patience and delay. In July, the British begin to bombard Quebec. The lower city is nearly destroyed, and new British commander James Wolfe cares to take Quebec, no matter what the cost. Believe me, my friends, if your conquest could be bought with the blood of your general, he would most cheerfully resign a life which he has long devoted to his country. <laughs> 
But by September, the British have yet to make a move on Quebec. Wolfe is very sick, but knows he must take the city before winter sets in. He takes a gamble and attacks the French right outside Quebec. On the night of September 13, 1759, the British crossed the St. Lawrence and climbed the cliffs outside the city. By morning, nearly 4,000 men have assembled on an abandoned farmer's field, named the Plains of Abraham. James Wolfe surveys the ground and waits for the French. He knows that this battle will decide the fate of Canada. Montcalm is taken by surprise and scrambles 5,000 men forming a disorganized line. At 8 o'clock, the battle begins. The French advance within range and fire a ragged volley. Highly disciplined British troops are unfazed. The French resume their advance, becoming more disordered with every step. When they are finally within 40 meters of the British, Wolfe prepares to fire. Is devastating, and when the British advance with bayonets, the French line collapses in confusion. The surviving French soldiers retreat back to Quebec, and the British are victorious. The battle lasts only 15 minutes, but over 1,300 men are killed, including both generals. Wolfe lives only long enough to hear of his victory. Then God be praised, I shall die in peace. Montcalm will die the next day, happy he will not live to see the British enter the city. On September 18th, the French retreat to Montreal and the British take control of Quebec. That winter, the French will try to retake the city, but will be forced to retreat due to lack of supplies. By the summer of 1760, the British have arrived in Montreal. On September 7th, Captain Bougainville meets with British General Geoffrey Amherst. Bougainville wants to negotiate a treaty that would allow the French to keep Montreal, but Amherst escorts him out of the office, saying, I have come for Canada, and I will accept nothing less. Brokenhearted, Bougainville returns to the French lines and prepares for surrender. I ordered the men to burn their colors to save them the embarrassment of handing them over to the enemy. The next day, the British will take control of Montreal. Fireworks light up the sky of Boston and New York. New France has fallen, and Britain and their colonies are victorious. In 1763, the Treaty of Paris gave Canada to the British. With this land came over 80,000 French Canadian citizens. Normally, these people would have been exiled or forced to become English, but this time, the British allowed the French to keep their culture, language, and religion. For the first time in history, French and British settlers would live together. After a brief rebellion, many natives were also granted new rights. However, many Americans were upset they had to share the continent after their victory. And this, combined with taxes imposed to pay for the war, would become causes of the American Revolution. The small skirmish that had begun in the wilds of Ohio had changed the world forever.
too far. Okay. We talked briefly about this mention of the rebellion, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, this Peace of Paris, or Treaty of Paris of 1763, it ceded all of known Canada to Britain, and, well, you know, we don't want to take everything and give nothing back, so we let the French have the Sugar Islands of Guadalupe and Martinique. Spain gave us Florida. Ooh! Why would Spain be involved? It's the French and Indian War. Well, you've got to consider for a minute, although there weren't any Spanish soldiers fighting in this war, no Spanish galleons showed up. The French and the Spanish are allies. They're both Catholic nations against the Protestant nation of England. So whereas Spain will ally with France and give her goods and supplies, she will not actually send troops. So we had to, she was an ally of France, and France had lost the war, so she has to be punished. So she gives us Florida, and we give her back Cuba and the Philippines, which we had captured. We also, I guess, we want the French totally out. So what are we going to do about New Orleans? That's a French settlement. So we actually give New Orleans to Spain. That's one of the reasons you have the mixed culture down there. You've got all those people from the islands coming in. It was originally a French settlement. It was turned over to Spain. And later it's going to go back to France. And it's going to be a chip moved around quite a bit. But as it's pointed out, it's going to be the attempt to pay for the cost of the war that's going to lead a lot to the American Revolution. As I stated earlier, the Indians, they were allies with the French. And Pontiac's group was allied with the French. Um, once they realize that the French are gone, they're not coming back, and with the French gone, the Indians are going, well, we don't want to be nice to these Indians anymore. It's going to get testy. Now, this little YouTube I've got, I think it's only two minutes long. The audio portion of it is a little bit sophomoric, but it's got some really great audio visuals in it. I'm not going to say just, just a quick two minutes or so. Hundreds of years ago, before the United States existed, and before colonists sailed across the ocean to the New World, North America was inhabited by Indian tribes. These natives roamed the land and embraced all its beauty. The Ottawa Indian tribe lived along the Detroit River in Michigan. Their leader was Chief Pontiac. Pontiac became a historically known leader after his attempt to unite tribes and fight the British to protect their people and their land. During the time period of Chief Pontiac, France and Great Britain had been fighting to expand their territories across North America. Pontiac supported the French in the French and Indian War, a war that took place in North America with the French and allied Native Americans fighting against the British. It lasted from 1754 to 1763. From this war, Britain had gained control of most of the territories in North America. Many Native Americans were unhappy with the colonization of the British and their post-war policies. They felt the pressure of the British moving west and feared losing their land. Pontiac saw the British as a threat to all Indian nations and planned a rebellion against them. In 1763, he organized his Ottawa tribe along with other tribes in the Great Lakes region to fight the British. This has become known as Pontiac's Rebellion. <laughs> The rebellion lasted for several years. The Native Americans were successful in bringing down nine of the 11 British forts in the region. With defeat in sight, the British turned to germ warfare. They exposed Indian tribes to smallpox disease through infected blankets, which killed many of the Native Americans. There were few warriors left to fight, and those that were left abandoned the rebellion. Pontiac's last attempt in driving out the British took place at Fort Detroit. The fighting lasted for several days, but due to lack of support, Pontiac was not successful, 
he was forced to retreat. Pontiac continued to try and seek out support from other Indian tribes, but many were unwilling to fight because they thought the British was just too powerful. Just months after leaving Fort Detroit, Pontiac was killed by an Indian of the Peoria tribe. Although Pontiac was unsuccessful in driving off the British, he has been admired by many for his courageous attempt. I don't know who the young lady was that made this particular YouTube, but I think the graphics and the Indian paintings and the music were just phenomenal. She deserves an A plus on that. I think your text goes on to say that um, not only was it confusion about uh, how they were going to be treated by the English, uh, Pontiac was a uh, religious warrior. Uh, a prophet, so to speak, and he had visions that it was urging the Indians to reject not only the European technologies and commercial relations and alcohol, but to expel the British forever, and we're going to have another Indian a few decades later called Tecumseh that has some of the same visions. The only way we're going to maintain our own identity and lands is to completely eliminate everything European. But there was confusion, as I said, and he encouraged the Indians of different tribes to consider themselves Indians to form a kind of pan-Indian identity, but it's not going to work because the British are going to put down the rebellion. It's a foregone conclusion. There's more English than there is Indians, and there's a lot more weaponry on the British side. So they issued something called the Proclamation of 1763, the Proclamation Line. Now this is a very short, I think another little short YouTube explaining what they want you to think it was. In 1763, the British issued a royal proclamation as an attempt to improve relations between the colonies and the Indians. So the proclamation of 1763 was the uh, first time that any uh, European government uh, used to coin the word the term Indian country. And it described all the countries uh, west of the Appalachians, essentially, uh, that was defined by a series of treaties negotiated uh, by the British Crown with the individual Indian tribes. And that country uh, was where the laws of the Indians uh, applied. In fact, the proclamation so says that the laws of the Indians apply, the laws of Great Britain did not. And if you went into the Indian country, you were subject to the laws of the Indian tribes. The proclamation of 1763, uh, like a lot of laws, probably did exactly the opposite of what it was intended to do. Uh, if it was intended to improve relationships between the colonies and the Indians, it seemed to do just the opposite because it, along with other uh, uh, English enactments, became the reason for the American Revolution. It, in effect, prohibited colonies, colonists from going into the Indian country and trying to acquire Indian land or to speculate in Indian land, and that did not please the colonists. Like I said, it was short. Uh, this proclamation line, according to the text in the little YouTube, was a way to placate the Indians. And basically, I could sum it up to say it was an effort by the British to prevent an all-out another Indian war. They thought they were going to be helping the Indians, but, well, you couldn't buy Indian land. You couldn't settle west of the mountains, and if you were already there, you had to get your behinds back onto the east of the mountains. Uh, it en enraged the settlers and land speculators who wanted their land because we were a land-hungry people. We're like yeast. The more you have, the more you wanted. It just kept spreading on westward. A lot of the colonists, even including our beautiful, much-loved First President George Washington, they ignored the policy and they purchased land anyway, especially in uh, western Virginia and eastern Kentucky. So, not solving the issue of the westward expansion, the act only seemed to exacerbate the Indian settlement relations, uh, deteriorating them rapidly. It just made what was not good already worse. And it didn't last long because they kept moving east. They kept moving east. And pretty soon it had to be, you know, just not even paying attention to it. So here you can see uh, 
This is the basically the Cumberland Mountains. You don't know, hear something funny. When I first started teaching Kentucky history in Kentucky, and of course I was born in Kentucky and lived there most of my life, I thought the Cumberland Mountains belonged to Kentucky and that they were just went through Kentucky because we got the Cumberland Pass and the Cumberland River and so it belonged to Kentucky. And I did not realize in my stupidity and educatedness until I went back to school that, uh, in the 1980s that, geez, these things run all the way from Georgia all the way up into Canada. I was also disappointed when I found out the famous Kentucky Long Rifle was really a Pennsylvania rifle. So these things that you learn, and I'm learning more about South Carolina every day I live. Um, <laughs> you have to laugh at yourself for being so naive sometimes. But the Seven Years' War, I guess you would say, completely changed all the American colonies, but none so drastically as Pennsylvania. It kind of shattered the rule of the old Quaker elite and ended the policy of accommodating the Indians. And many Western settlers pushed the colony's government into a more aggressive stance toward the Indians during the war and the brutal warfare on the colony's frontier. It kind of deepened the Western Pennsylvania farmers' antagonism toward any Indian. And according to them, the only good Indian was a dead Indian. And during Tonyak's Rebellion, a group of armed farmers, I think they were called Axton Boys, actually marched on Philadelphia demanding that they be allowed to attack and they massacred Indians along the way uh, whether they were good Indians, bad Indians, it didn't matter if they were Indians they were killed and they did pressure the governor into expelling peaceful Indians from the city and by the end of the 1760s Pennsylvania's holy experiment and William Penn's quest for peace between Europeans and the Indians was over So colonists emerged from this war with what we call a greater sense of collective identity. Before the war, we had 13 individual, isolated, self-autonomous little colonies. Each one thought they were their own country. And Benjamin Franklin had tried back in 1754 to get them all together, but that mm -mm, nobody wanted to give up their rule. It'd be kind of like asking your county governor to give, or your county judges to give up their rule. And although there had been some tensions between the American and British soldiers and officers during the war, uh, for instance, especially in the Northeast, the colonists up there thought, well, this is Britain's war, it's not the colonies' war, and sometimes the British soldiers would have to go into their homes and actually forcefully recruit them for the army. But for the most part, uh, the colonists came away from the war with a sense that was accelerated by their belief and they were true Englishmen. And that this defeated France, well, it just, it just showed that being British and liberty and freedom and Protestantism all wrapped up into one big package. So we were very proud of being British and winning the war and defeating those dastardly popish French. But it wouldn't be very long, as it was pointed out at the end of that little YouTube, that in an effort to pay for the war, because the war had lasted so long and was so expensive, the taxes. And the King George wanted to be a king, in fact, as well as name, and he started to want to get the colonists under control. After all, the colonists were established for the benefit of England, and they were acting like they didn't really need England. And we're going to start having problems. 1763 is the magic marker when we start having problems. Our relations with Mother England are going to go to sour. And before you know it, we're going to wind up with a revolution. So we end the first section with chapter 4, and the next chapter, chapter 5, begins section 2, which takes us through 1840. And we begin that section with our American Revolution in chapter 5. But before we get there, we're going to have a test. But before the test, take your quiz and answer your questions over this chapter. And I strongly suggest you review your PowerPoints and notes before you begin your test over chapters 1 through 4. Don't believe you'll have any problems. I think everything will be fine. But just take it easy. Remember, one test is not an entire grade make. Uh, your first test is always the most difficult. But the test that you have is going to be almost identical to what the quizzes are. Uh, the only difference would be your short answer. It will be multiple choice. Uh, 
I, I don't have any, I don't have any true and false on there. I don't like true and false really. But there'll be uh, multiple choice. What I call short answers, one or two words. Uh, maybe a little bit longer answer, one or two sentences. Then you'll have an essay, and I request so many words that I suggest you count the words because I do. And you could have an absolutely correct answer, but if I've requested a hundred words and you only give me fifty, you will not get the full point take, even if the answer is correct. So take your time. I suggest when you open your test, you look all the way through it and come back because I don't have it. You don't. I don't have the test fixed so that you have to complete an answer before you can go on. The whole test will come up and open. Look through it, and I would suggest answer at that point in time anything that you know immediately, and spend most time on the questions that have the most points. Don't spend 15 minutes on a one-point multiple-choice question, which would cut into your time where you might not be able to spend as much time as you needed on a 15 or 20-point. Well, I don't have any 20-point questions, but I mean for a larger count. So use your noodle. Don't panic. It's just one test of many. And there again, good luck. Next time we meet, we're going to be starting the revolution.